Thank you, Dottie. What fun it is to hear those songs as our accompanists play the, uh, the, the, the prelude for us and prepare us for worship. Worship isn't just being solemn. That, you can't get solemn with that song, right? Sometimes worship makes you jump up and, and shout, so uh, we're going to do that in a moment. But um, anyway, we want to welcome you. Thank you so much for coming to worship with us at Five Forks this morning. Thank you to those of you who are joining us on the live stream. I'm Pastor Ray, and I want to welcome you to Five Forks. As we say each Sunday, we gather together to worship, we gather to encourage one another and to learn to know and love and follow Jesus, but then we know that our mission is to be sent out into the world to be the witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know there are at least two people in here who know that today is a special Sunday on the church calendar. What is it, Joe? Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday this morning, and I know Dottie knows that because she mentioned it at our prayer hour, had a great time at our prayer hour on Friday evening. Um, Pentecost Sunday, when the church began, when the church w was started, and, and my prayer is that today we will be filled with God's Spirit so that we too can share boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ as we leave here. I'd like to begin uh, with a story from, from Luke's Gospel about when salvation came to a particular home. You're familiar with this story, but I love reading these over and over again. Luke's Gospel, chapter 19. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus, and he was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore fig tree beside the road where Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, Jesus looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. So Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house and in great, with great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor, Lord, and, I, and if I've cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. Verse 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. The gospel is probably not said any more succinctly than that. And it's that statement that's the focus of our first song that we want to sing this morning. When, when there are people who many want to condemn and punish those who have done wrong, Jesus comes to forgive and to save. What a contrast in the way people relate to others. Jesus teaches us how we must relate to those. So let's stand and sing, we've heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let's stand together, it's number 277 if you're using a hymn book. have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the tidings all around, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the waves, onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Send it on the rolling tide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Tell the sinners far and wide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing ye islands of the sea. Echo back the ocean caves, earth shall keep her jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. 
Sing above the battle's rise. Jesus saves, Jesus saves by his death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom when the heart for mercy prays. Sing and triumph for the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Amen. You may be seated, or if you're too excited to sit down, you're you're welcome to remain standing as well. You know, as I thought about our next song, a question came to my mind, why does God go to such great lengths to save people, to transform people, to rescue people? It's because of God's great love for humankind. Humankind made in God's own image, made to be in fellowship with God and with each other. It's because of God's great love for us that God has done what God has done so that we can be his people. Let's sing about the love of God. It's number 36 if you're using a hymn book. Love of God 
that above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the hope that went from sky to sky. The love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless. One of the amazing things that happens to someone who chooses to follow Jesus is that we discover freedom, real freedom. You know, finding freedom, hanging on to our personal freedom is a buzzword these days between many. But this morning, we want to remember that God is offering us freedom from sin, freedom from destructive behaviors and attitudes that crush our lives and destroy our hope. The song is Glorious Freedom. Let's sing together. It's number 440 in your hymn book. Once I was bound by sin's galling fetters, chained like a slave. Struggled in pain, but I received a glorious freedom when Jesus broke my fetters in twain. Glorious freedom, wonderful freedom, no more in chains of sin I repine. Jesus the glory. Emancipator, now and forever, he shall be mine. Freedom from all the carnal affections, freedom from envy, hatred, and strife, freedom from pain and worldly ambitions. Freedom from all that sad in my life. Glorious freedom, wonderful freedom. No more in chains of sin I repine. Jesus the glorious emancipator, now and forever he shall be. Freedom from pride and all sinful follies. Freedom from love and glitter of gold. Freedom from evil, temper and anger. Glorious freedom, rapture untold. Glorious freedom, wonderful freedom, no more in chains of sin I repine. Jesus the glorious emancipator, now and forever he shall be mine. Freedom from fear with all of its torments, freedom from care with all of its pain, freedom in Christ, my blessed Redeemer, He who has rent my fetters in twain. Glorious freedom, wonderful freedom, no more in chains of sin I repine. Jesus the glorious emancipator, now and forever he shall be mine. 
Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we can't thank you enough for the salvation that you offer and then the transformation that you make possible in our lives. Father, thank you for that freedom from all those things that want to destroy us. Our attitudes, our sinful habits, Father, all of that, you give us the power through your Spirit to live lives that are pleasing to you. And we want to thank you for that. Father, we thank you that you created the fellowship of the church, this gathering of your people where we can remind one another of your goodness. We can help each other, encouraging one another. We can hold each other accountable. But Father, you've brought us together in fellowship so that we can be a testimony to the world of who you are. Help us to love each other extravagantly, Father, and help us to show that love and share that love with those who don't know you, those who are still bound in the chains of lifestyles and thoughts and attitudes and issues that just are destroying them. Lord, we know that we have so much to learn ourselves, but we thank you for your ongoing care and love and help to us. So we want to be the church that shares that good news of the gospel boldly. Lord, thank you for meeting with us. Thank you for making your presence felt. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. For those of you who may not know me, I'm Chris Phillips. I'm pastor of children's ministries here at Five Forks Church. And whether you're here in the auditorium or you're viewing us online or watching during a replay sometime during the week, we're so glad that you have chosen to join us today. Now, we want to connect with everyone, but if you're here in the auditorium, directly in front of you in the seat back is an orange connect card. 
And in that Connect card, you're going to fill out some basic information so that you can take that after the service directly out the doors to the Connect station. And there you're going to meet some wonderful folks, some of our staff, some really wonderful volunteers that we have. And in addition to some great conversation, you're going to be able to get a free bag of chocolate chip cookies that were freshly baked this morning. So they're really yummy and delicious, so take advantage of that. For those of you watching online, we want to connect with you as well. You can simply go to our website, www.ffbic.org, and look for the New Here tab, and there you're going to fill out that same basic information, and someone from our church is going to reach out to you just to say hello, just to get to know you a little bit better. This Saturday, we are going to be having another free food pickup here at the Five Forks Food Pantry. It's open to anyone. It begins at 8 a.m., and the boxes are already prepackaged, and we will be operating that until all of them are gone. So it's first come, first serve basis. You don't need a reservation. There is uh, no restrictions on that. So tell your friends, your family, come on out here and take advantage of that. Now, before I turn it over to Pastor Sean for this morning's message, I have some really exciting news. Registration is now open for our Vacation Bible Camp. Yes, Vacation Bible Camp is back in person for the first time in two years. So we're really excited about that. And it's going to take place July 23rd, 24th, and 25th. Now, you might be thinking, Chris, that doesn't sound right. It is. It's actually going to be a weekend vacation Bible camp. It's going to start out on Friday evening at 6 p.m. with a dinner, and we will continue on Saturday and end on Sunday morning with a very special time with a single service right here in the auditorium beginning at 9 a.m. We want all of you here at this 8 o'clock service, everyone at the 945 service, all the friends and family and everyone to fill this place and you're going to get to see the kids. We're going to get to have a great time. You're going to get to see what went on during Vacation Bible Camp, and it's just going to be wonderful. So mark your calendars now. Plan to be here. It's going to be an awesome, awesome event. Now, you might be thinking, but Chris, what do I care about Vacation Bible Camp? I'm too old for it. Well, guess what? You're not. You can volunteer to be a part of this wonderful event. I have paper registrations out at the Connect station, or you can talk to me, or you can get on our website and register right there. There's all kinds of things that we can uh, get you to get involved with that we need your help with. One of the most important things that I have for you to do is tell your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your family, your neighbors, whoever that may be, all about Vacation Bible Camp and invite them to join us for this wonderful time. Again, details and information are located on the Connect station with the registration forms or on our website. And again, you can also call me right here at the church or send me an email with anything else that you might be wondering about. Now, Pastor Sean, I'm going to turn it over to you for this morning's message. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm really excited about this Vacation Bible Camp, mostly because Chris didn't clarify this, so I'm just going to read between the lines. He said it's Friday evening, Saturday, and Sunday. Jenny and I are just going to bring our kids and drop them off Friday and come back Sunday morning to pick them up. Is that all right, Chris? I mean, is that... All right. <laughs> uh, no, I think it's going to be fantastic. I'm really excited. Uh, we're trying something uh, neat this year, but trying to bring the church family together. You know how sometimes... You wonder who's, who's going to the other service, and sometimes you don't know, and it, you just don't cross paths and stuff, and this will be a great opportunity for our entire church family to come together at one time, and so uh, really looking forward to uh, Vacation Bible Camp. Hey, uh, we are in the uh, fourth week of our series this morning on Jesus and women, and so if you have a Bible, go ahead and pull it out. I'll be giving you instructions for where we're going to turn here in just a minute. Uh, there's an intriguing scene in the movie Schindler's List, I don't know if you're familiar with the movie, um, the movie Schindler's List, a profound conversation takes place between uh, two of the characters in the movie, between Schindler and one of the German commanders. This is around the time uh, when the Nazis are basically exterminating the Jews, and there's a, a profound conversation about the nature of power, who has power and how it's used. Uh, and the German soldier, the German commander, he has this line where he says, 
Control is power. Control is power. Control causes fear and dominance over. It causes obedience. We can do whatever we want and the person we're controlling has no say in what we are doing. We can even condemn, abuse without repercussion and no one can stop us. And that is how power, I would say, is often viewed in our world. That's not power though. You see, that's false power. That is power that has been corrupted. And so in this conversation, there is a classic line from the movie, which maybe you have heard uh, before, where Schindler says to the commander, that's not power. Rather, he says, power is when we have every justification to kill. Whenever we have the authority, the control, the ability to dominate, and we don't. We choose not to. Rather than using power as a form of control and condemnation, he says instead we choose, our, we choose to use our power as a way to give life and to bring freedom. He says that is true power. And you see this morning's message is all about power. It's all about who holds power, how it's used, and how it should be used. We are in the fourth week today, as I mentioned, of our series called Jesus and Women. One of the more remarkable aspects of the gospel stories in the context of the ancient Middle East is Jesus' inclusion of women in his group of followers. And we've been taking five weeks here to just kind of walk through these stories. Next week will be our final week. And we're trying to pay careful attention to some of the cultural significance of these stories. And then we've been talking about what we learn as followers of Jesus. And so if you have a Bible, we're going to John chapter 8 today. John chapter 8. This morning's story is the story of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. In this story, there are three primary characters. And so we're actually just going to follow the story through the experience of these three characters, all right? And so first, let's just take a look at the power-hungry Pharisees the power-hungry Pharisees. I'm going to begin reading in verse 2. Verse 2. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all of the people had gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. Jesus is located right now at the place of power in the Jewish world and we are told he sits down to teach. This is typical uh, rabbinic style. He is basically claiming power and authority to explain the scriptures and to share the scriptures. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this as a question, as a trap, in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. And I'll tell you what's going on here is really this whole conversation about power and who's in control and who has it and how it should be used. Are you familiar with the phrase power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely? It's a phrase that sometimes gets mentioned. Now, we have to be careful with the phrase power in and of itself is not evil, but as with all good things that God created, power can be corrupted. And you see, power is corrupted when used... Rather than as a tool to give life, it is used instead to condemn and to control. And there are a couple of clear indicators here about the motives of the power-hungry Pharisees and their behavior. You will notice the story says that this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And you should ask yourself immediately two questions. And here's the first one. The first question is, How exactly do religious professionals catch a woman in the act of adultery? Don't you ask yourself that question? How exactly is it that the Pharisees caught this woman in the act of adultery? And the second question, did you ever wonder what happened to the man in this story? Do you know that adultery takes two people? And somehow the man has disappeared from the story. In fact, according to Jewish law, 
that the Pharisees are claiming to uphold. Book of Leviticus, the man is to be put to death as well, but somehow he has disappeared from the scene of the crime. Now, why would they do this? Why would the Pharisees do this? It's because the religious leaders, they don't actually care about upholding the law. And they certainly don't care about, they don't have the woman's best intentions at heart in the story. No, you see, the primary motivation for the Pharisees in this story is power. How to maintain power at all costs. They are actually threatened by Jesus and his popularity, which is starting to grow. They're threatened by his interpretations of the Jewish scriptures and his movement, which is, continues to grow. People are starting to believe the things that Jesus is saying. And the Pharisees, they are afraid of losing their power and their control in the community. And notice this, they will sacrifice truth, justice, fairness, common sense. They will sacrifice their morals if that's what it takes in order to maintain power. And you see, that's why power is such a dangerous tool in our world. It is this temptation to be in control, to be able to call the shots, to use and abuse and manipulate the world and circumstances and other people to our advantage. And oh, how we love to be in control and the one calling the shots to make sure that our privileges and our rights are taken care of. We believe that our ability to be in control is the thing that will ultimately save us. Just a little bit of history here for you. Do you know for about the first 300 years of the church's existence, the followers of Jesus could best be described as a persecuted minority. The followers of Jesus were just little pockets of people all around who were choosing to follow Jesus. They had no real power in the grand scheme of the world and basically persecuted by many of the world's empires. But in the year 312, a significant event occurred that seemed to be the beginning of change. There was a Roman emperor, Constantine, who was fighting for control of the Roman Empire. There's a famous story about a battle that took place at Milvian Bridge, where the emperor, Constantine, that night before one of their major battles, claimed to have had a vision. And in his vision, God told him to put the symbol of Christ... On the shields of his soldiers. Most legends would say it was the symbol of the cross. And again, legend has it that Constantine's army went on to win the battle the next day. And it became the impetus for Christianizing the empire. Basically, he said everybody had to become a Christian. And so that's when Christianity basically gained power and control as an empire. And the cross which had been a symbol of sacrificial love given up for enemies, was emblazoned on shields of corrupt power and violence. And almost overnight, Christianity went from a persecuted minority to a persecuting majority. And you know, since that time, the church has struggled to understand its identity and posture and the role of power for followers of Jesus. I think sometimes followers of Jesus today believe that the kingdom of God is most secure and is most influential when the people of God hold positions of power and control. Because then we can dominate other people. And so we also tend to put the cross on our shields and our swords and our positions and our stances and our views and our privileges. And so sadly, when that happens, we also tend to sacrifice truth and justice and fairness and common sense. And we will even sacrifice our morals in order to make sure we maintain power. It is very difficult indeed, one author says, to get across a message of love and power at the same time because often one of them loses out. Whenever we catch the church trying to win, we often end up losing. You see, the truth is, having controlling power 
often makes things comfortable for the people of God, but it often doesn't help us to act like followers, believers of Jesus. In fact, when Jesus was arrested and put on trial before Pilate, it looked in this moment as if all power was being taken from Jesus. This would be the time for Jesus to really let his power show. Do you remember the conversation that takes place between Jesus and Pilate about power? Here's what Jesus says. But my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to pre prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Power in my kingdom looks just a little bit differently. And what does it look like? What does power, what does control in the kingdom of God look like? Paul wrote about it in Ephesians 6. He wrote, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. How? Like this, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in its place, your feet fitted with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Jesus says power in his kingdom. It's not about control and manipulation and maintaining privilege, but instead it is marked by a life, a character of righteousness and peace and faith and truth. I think as we look back on the Pharisees, we too must be careful about the way in which we use and allow power to be used in our world. And it actually brings us to the second character in this story. The powerless woman. The powerless woman. You know, almost immediately when we hear this story, we are inclined to begin pointing to the fact that she was a sinful woman. And somehow we need to set her straight. And that's where we go first. And we're going to get to that in just a few minutes, all right? But before we get to that, we need to recognize something else about this woman. And that is that in order to maintain their power, the religious leaders... They have to take advantage of somebody. They have to use somebody in their power-mongering game. We asked earlier, where is the man in all of this? This woman is simply a pawn to be taken advantage of, used, and then disposed of. She has no opportunity to tell her story. She has no opportunity to explain her situation or what happened. Not that she's innocent. And again, we're going to get to that in a moment. But for now... At this moment, she simply represents the powerless. And all of those around her are indifferent to her suffering, her life, and her situation. Scholar Ken Bailey writes that some form of this woman's story has been played out for centuries by countless thousands. Those who are powerless, used, neglected, avoided, and abused. Because this is what happens when maintaining power and privilege becomes our driving force and motivation. It is often at the expense of the powerless and the weak. Many of you are probably aware of much of the violence that has been taking place over in the Middle East recently. You've heard some of these uh, reports and stories on the news recently, I'm sure. And there are all different kinds of opinions about what exactly should be done and who is at fault. Do you know who is often overlooked, though, in many of the stories that are being shared and the conversations that are had? It's the powerless. It's those who are often caught up in the crossfire of the powerful empire's cruel power-mongering games. The situation has somewhat of a more personal nature for myself and really for our church. Did you know that? You may or may not be aware of this, but we actually support a couple that is living over in Beit Jala right now. Very close to Bethlehem. This is a picture of Jen and Ra'ed. And I think there's another picture. You can go ahead and bring up the next picture of their kids. This is their four kids uh, who live with them over in Beit Jala. Uh, Jen is my cousin and her husband, uh, Ra'ed. Jen grew up an American living here in Pennsylvania, and Ra'ed is actually a Palestinian. And I will tell you, these are faces that represent 
the countless thousands who are caught up in the middle of the struggle for power and control in the Middle East. Innocent faces of those caught up in the power struggle. Jen shared recently that they hear the gunfire and the rockets in the distance during the night. And she says, we know what that means. It's the loss of innocent life. The seizing and bombing of homes and the immense pain and suffering is unbearable to witness. We feel helpless in the enormity of this ongoing devastation. They feel like pawns. She said the other night their oldest daughter, Lena, asked her, Mommy, will a missile hit our house while we're sleeping? And so in my best effort to reassure her, I told her that the fighting is far away from us, about 400 kilometers, which is not that far away. I told her that God's guardian angels are surrounding our house, watching over us and protecting us, which is what I tell my kids every night. I'm not sure what else there is to tell her. Jen goes on to share another story about a a young family that was even closer to the fighting. A gut-wrenching story about a young lady, Najaye. She's a Palestinian girl about the same age as Lena, and Lena's about 10, whose family was determined to stay together at all times, day and night. They're much closer to where the fighting is taking place. Said their family was moving from room to room together so that if the worst happened, they would remain whole as a family. As explosions echoed all around them, Najaye had to go to the bathroom. Her mother told her to go quickly and come back to them. Najaye refused to leave them, but her mother insisted that nothing would happen in those two minutes. So she sent her father with her to the bathroom, and in the next moment, a missile entered their home, killing Najaye's mother, two sisters, and two brothers. Najaye and her father were pulled out of the rubble nine hours later, alive yet no longer whole. And Jen goes on to write, For almost a century, Palestinians are a people who for the most part have gone unseen and unheard. They are the powerless. They have no voice. There is no one to stand up and tell their story. And she says it's true that the most extreme members have made a name for themselves, but the common people... The ones who build families and work to provide for them, who want their children to experience safety and security and success and delight in life, these people are simply lost in a sea of turmoil. Church, I believe that the powerless, the voiceless, the unseen are our priority. It is our priority to know and to be aware of their situations And it is our priority to step in and to raise our voices on their behalf and to tell their stories. That's what Jesus was doing for the powerless woman that day. He said, I'm going to stand for you. Because nobody else cares. You have no voice. I will stand for you, with you, first of all. I would just encourage you, please, this week, take some time to become a little bit more aware. And I would just invite you to join me, join the church. We prayed on Friday night. Pray for Jen and Raed and pray for Lena and pray for Elias and pray for Leon and pray for Noir and for many others who are just caught up in the world's power-mongering games. It's our responsibility, church. And it's why we are thankful there's one more character in our story, right? The most important character. And he's the one who has all the power anyway. He just uses his power a little bit differently. And so let's turn and look at Jesus for just a moment. What do you say, Jesus? But Jesus bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. I'm now in verse 7. And when they kept questioning Jesus, he straightened up and he said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, Jesus stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Scholars have long debated exactly what it was that Jesus was writing on the ground that day. 
Nobody really knows. I've heard all different kinds of suggestions. Uh, One suggestion is that it was custom in Roman law that before the judge would state verbally what his uh, decision was, he would write it out first. And so some suggest that before Jesus spoke verbally, that he was writing out what he was about to say. He was kind of claiming authority in the situation to make a judgment. Some think Jesus was writing the Ten Commandments so that he was allowing all those gathered around a moment to think about their own sin before he made a statement about you without sin. They could just sit there and look at the list he had written out. Some think Jesus was a little more direct and that he actually started writing out the specific sins of the religious leaders standing in the group. Like, for example, maybe he was writing out standing at the window watching adultery take place longer than is necessary for gathering evidence. Maybe that's what Jesus was writing out. Whatever it is that Jesus is writing, He confronts the corruption and power-hungry men with their own corruption. And there must have been a hush over that crowd. You talk about awkward silence when Jesus made his statement. Everybody has their stones. What are you going to do now? And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and he asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. Two things I just want to point out about Jesus' response here. And the first is this one. Notice Jesus' immediate response. Jesus accepted the sinful woman. Or we might say Jesus loved the sinful woman. His first response was not to quote the law to her. It was not to point out her sin. That was not first. His initial response was to accept her, support her, stand up for her. He used his power first to love the adulterous woman. And let me just clarify what I mean here. Because sometimes I think we get this wrong. We say, oh yeah. We say things like, "Love love the sinner and hate the sin. But we don't always do a great job of living that out. Here's what it means to accept and to love a sinner. To accept someone is not simply to tolerate them. It doesn't mean putting up with somebody. It means to affirm to them, you think it's a very good thing, that person is alive. It means to genuinely like the other person. One author says it like this. When messed up sinners came to Jesus, the only sinless person who ever lived... He did not merely endure them with patient resignation. No, Jesus genuinely liked them. He loved the sinful woman standing before him that day. Heard a really neat story one time about a young lady. Grew up and she was writing about her childhood. I may have shared this before. It's one of my favorites. She says, I grew up knowing I was different and I hated it. She writes that I was born with a cleft palate. And when I started school, my classmates always made it clear to me how I looked to others. A little girl with a misshapen lip, crooked nose, lopsided teeth, and garbled speech. And when classmates asked what happened to your lip, I'd always tell them that I'd fallen and cut it on a piece of glass. Somehow it seemed more acceptable to have suffered an accident than to have been born different. I was convinced that no one outside of my family could love me. She goes on to write, There was, however, a teacher in the second grade whom we all adored, Mrs. Leonard. Mrs. Leonard was short and round and happy. She was a sparkling lady. Annually, we had a hearing test. Mrs. Leonard gave the test to everyone in the class. Finally, it was my turn. She writes that I knew from past experiences that as we stood against the door and covered one ear, the teacher sitting at her desk would whisper something, and then we would have to repeat it back. Things like, the sky is blue. Do you have new shoes And so I waited for those words that God must have put into her mouth. Those seven words she says that changed my life. Mrs. Leonard said to me in her whisper, I wish you were my little girl. Do you know in this moment, I believe Jesus genuinely liked the adulterous woman before him. And when he looked at her, his first thought was not disgust by her appearance or by her failure. 
But instead, Jesus saw a young woman who was made in the image of God, who needed to be loved and restored. And Jesus said to the adulterous woman that day, he said, I wish, I wish you were my little girl. As followers of Jesus, we should be known as people who like, genuinely like people who are nothing like us. See, we are not called to clean up society. In fact, when you read through the Gospels, Jesus and Paul spent almost no energy trying to clean up the Roman Empire, despite some of their horrible practices. So our challenge is not always, it's not imposing our morality on others, but it's spreading this far more radical message that God loves sinners. That we genuinely like those people in our lives who are hard for us to like. I'll give you one suggestion. Here's how you can get started. Here's the best way to start. Because this is really hard. This is challenging stuff. One of the best ways we can start to show genuine love is by learning how to listen better. It's as simple as that. We just got to learn how to listen to each other better. Listening is a powerful tool, and many of us don't know how to do it well. We like talking at people, and we like fixing people, but we don't like listening to their stories. There's two ways to listen to people. The first way is to look for flaws in what they have to say, isn't it? And as soon as somebody starts talking, we know we already disagree with their position or their lifestyle, where it is that they're coming from. And so rather than listening to them, We're looking for the flaws so we can figure out how we're going to correct them as soon as they're done talking. That's one way that we listen to people, isn't it? Do you know what the other way is? We start with believing the good and seeing the humanity in other people as they are speaking. And we begin to ask ourselves questions like, what is the other person really saying? What's going on behind the hurt that they are sharing? How are they feeling? And why do they feel this way? In what way have I or my group of people contributed to that feeling? If somebody I loved was feeling that way, what would I do for them? I think Jesus was an expert listener. And I think that the first step to genuinely loving others is to listen first. In fact, I think one of the marks of maturity and faith is whenever we are able to listen with patience and compassion to people with whom we disagree. One, one writer says it like this, these people often tell no one their secrets because they are certain the stone throwing will begin. You'll know that you're starting to develop a heart like Jesus when people are willing to share some of their most vulnerable hurts and failures with you. Why is it that, ancient, that in ancient times, women like this so often ran to Jesus, but in modern times, they so often run from his followers. We have to become better at listening and loving sinners. And then second, accepting is not the same thing as approving. Accepting is not approving. Accepting a person and genuinely loving them doesn't mean we approve of their behavior. Jesus does not approve of the woman's past. He says to her, now go and leave your life of sin. Can I just tell you why I think Jesus says this to the woman though? It's not because he takes pleasure in pointing out her sin. I think sometimes when we're calling out the sin we see in others, it's, we get a sense of, there's like this, oh yeah, I get, to, I get to call it out, the wrong that they are doing. Somehow it makes me feel good. I don't think that's what's going on here for Jesus. And if that's our motivation, we actually missed step one about loving the person genuinely first. And we should stop and go back to number one. If you don't genuinely care about the person, don't start calling out their sin. No, instead, I think Jesus addresses the woman's sin after he has proven his love for her. The truth is he does genuinely love her. He wants the absolute best for her life. And he knows that a life of adultery does not lead to a life of joy and peace and contentment, which is what the woman is really after. Jesus wants her to experience abundant life. Jesus said one time, I have come that you might have life abundantly. And he knows that in sin, she will never experience that life. So first we show that we genuinely care. And then we listen with compassion 
And that opens the door for us to be able to share about some of those harder issues in life. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for these stories. Thank you that that they were written down, that they have been preserved for us, and that as we take time to read, as we sit at your feet, we are able to learn about life and how we are to live, and what a challenging story this morning. The incredible call to love sinners. And we confess to you how hard that is. Always kind of been reminded, though, that that's really what the cross was all about. It was all about loving sinners, and it always starts with me. And so I thank you for your great love for me. Thank you for your patience in my life. Thank you that in those moments where I have done things I shouldn't, you compassionately listen. You allow me to speak out and to share my heart. And then you help me to live differently. So we thank you for the example of Jesus. And all we're asking today, Lord, is that you would help us to be one of those churches in this community. And today in particular, I just want to pause and I want to pray for so many powerless in our world who are often caught up in the world's power games and they have no voice. And so we just pray for so many families, particularly families right now over in the Middle East that have been wrecked and homes have been destroyed. And Lord, I don't know what it looks like for you to step into their situations and to prove your presence to them, but we ask that you would. We pray for Jen and Raed. We pray for their kids. Pray that you would keep them safe and that you would help them to sleep at night and that they would be able to rest comfortably in your arms because we do believe that you are the one who is ultimately in control. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me, please, as we sing a song that we love to sing because of what it says, but it's more difficult for us to offer grace that is greater than the other person's sin. And that's what we're called to do as followers of Jesus. We've just heard a story of Jesus' amazing grace. Grace that was greater than that woman's sin. We believe that God has given us grace that is greater than our sin. But following Jesus means that we offer that grace to others that we come in contact. That's the hard part that I believe we are called to. Let's sing number 65, Grace That Is Greater Than Our Sin.
What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide, whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon. dark is this the stain that we can't hide you know we all come with that that stain and when you say man what's the thing that takes it away what am I hanging my hat on it's God's incredible grace when he looks at my life he did that 2,000 years ago for a woman caught in adultery I believe he does it every single day for every one of us may you live in the marvelous grace of Jesus this week and may you just share that grace with so many people in your life. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today, and I hope we will see you next Sunday morning.